night may be long and the dark may be deep, but the answers are there to be found. Whether it's the normal, the abnormal, or the paranormal, you're in the right place. Let's go beyond reality. Welcome to the show. It's going to be about the strange tonight and mysterious tonight. We're going to be talking about the life of Howard Hughes. A lot of people have forgotten how uh, eccentric this billionaire, at one point the richest man in the world, was. But we're going to get reminded of all that tonight with our guest, Jeff Schumacher. He is an author. He's also the vice president of exhibits and programs for the Mob Museum in Las Vegas. Another interesting um, topic that we'll address tonight as well. Jeff has written a bike, a bike, a book called Howard Hughes, Power Paranoia and Palace Intrigue. Try saying that. 10 times fast. Anyway, it's going to be really fascinating to have this conversation, and I've got a personal interest in it, and I'll explain why when we bring Jeff in, Um, but it's going to be a lot of fun. A couple things I want to remind you of. One is, uh, please go to the YouTube channel. If you have not been uh, become a subscriber yet, do that. There's no fee or anything. It's free. Just go to YouTube and search for J.V. Johnson. Uh, The full name is J.V. Johnson's Beyond Paranormal. Subscribe to the channel. Become part of our community there. There is about 600 back episodes of the program available for your viewing enjoyment and listening enjoyment. Plus, if you join us there for the live stream, there's a chat room that uh, tackles all sorts of issues uh, throughout the course of the show when we're streaming live. And of course, chat room, you know what those issues are. They aren't necessarily always directly related to the topic of the program for that night, but they're always interesting nonetheless. And the reverse is true. If you have not found the podcast version of Beyond Reality, please look for that as well. It's available on all major podcast distribution platforms, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and others. And uh, subscribe to them as well because when you subscribe you get the show downloaded to your smart device automatically and it's there if you want to listen if you're driving somewhere and you missed a show you can go back and find it there and uh, be caught up uh, um, up to date on on the topics that we've been talking about here it's a great way to become um, in the know and make sure you're up to date with what we've got going on so a lot of weird stuff going around all around the world, but I hope everybody is making the best of it and being safe and being smart. That's the only option right now. We'll take a break, and when we come back, we'll bring Jeff Schumacher in. We're looking forward to this discussion with Jeff. It's going to be a great time right here on Beyond Reality. We'll be right back. Please support the program. Go to patreon.com slash Joha. That's J-O-H-A-W. I'm actually very excited to have our guest tonight with us, Jeff Schumacher, is an author. He's also the vice president of exhibits and programs for the Mod Mob Museum. He's got a book called Howard Hughes, Power, Paranoia, Paranoia, and Palace Intrigue. Jeff, I've been trying to say that all night, and it's a tongue twister, but welcome to the program. It's great to have you here. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I have to tell you, I've got a real personal interest in this topic, in in addition to the fact that we're going to be talking about a, a, a very interesting character, an individual in the form of Howard Hughes, one of, you know, how we, we all kind of grow up in our childhood, there are certain points in our childhood that we remember very distinctly, and we carry with them with us for the rest of our lives. One of those points for me, and it's very unusual, I think, but was I, I was sitting at home with my mother, I was a very young boy at the time. And we were watching a movie on television. And before today, I didn't know what that movie was called. But because of our discussion tonight, I did a little research. And it turns out the film was called The Amazing, I think The Amazing Howard Hughes with Tommy Lee yeah. Jones. Yeah. I remember watching that as a very young boy and being fascinated by this man, being fascinated by the fact that he became so wealthy and so successful in so many different areas. And then... The exclamation point on the whole thing was the end of his life when he became so eccentric. I've carried that with me for my entire life. After that, watching that film, I did a little research, read some stuff, and I tried to have conversations with friends and family. No one, I couldn't find anybody else that shared that same passion for that story. Um, So I'm excited to have this conversation because I've been uh, carrying this story with me for a long time. Well, you know, that's how it is with Howard Hughes. From my experience interviewing people uh, for my book and, and having, you know, getting reaction to the book, you know, people seem to really 
uh, some people seem to have a great attraction to him. You know, they, they're just sort of obsessed with him and they want to learn everything they can about him and learn what his secrets were and what, you know, what, what his, his problems were and how to overcome those. And uh, he's an inspirational character on one hand, and on the other, he's also just a tragedy of a story. Yeah, and it's that it's that dichotomy. It's that it's that kind of both ends of the spectrum that make him so interesting. And I remember the end of that made-for-TV movie. It turns out it was uh, actually yeah. I think it was may even been a miniseries. But I remember him in like a white robe. They showed him with extremely long fingernails, hair, you know, down to past his shoulders, tinkering with something on a table. Um, and, and that image kind of haunted me for a long time. It reminds me of how we all look right now, like in, <laughs> <laughs> in our homes, right? Yeah. We're all uh, sequestered in our homes. But, uh, no, he, uh, uh, you know, definitely uh, the end of his life was very different from the, you know, the first two-thirds of his life when... He was, you know, just one of the most dynamic individuals in the world. And uh, to see him at, be at such heights and to fall to such depths what is, is a big part of his story. And we're going to talk about all of that tonight. But let's start with how the Howard Hughes story began. Where did this man come from? Well, you know, it's interesting. Howard Hughes uh, was, was essentially uh, uh, the son of a rich man. I mean, his father, Howard Hughes Sr., uh, was uh, a, an entrepreneur uh, from the get-go. He was originally from Iowa, and he uh, got involved with the oil uh, business when it was booming in the very first part of the 20th century. And he came up with the drill bit that would would drill oil wells so much more efficiently than had been done before. And he was very clever. What he did is he didn't just start selling these to people. He leased leased the drill bits so that you know he retained control of them and. He became a millionaire when Howard was a very young boy. And so Howard, uh, you know, was, was born in, in Houston or the Houston area. And he, uh, his dad was very much a part of the whole high society in, in, uh, Houston. Meanwhile, Howard's uncle, his father's brother, was a big star and a big screenwriter and a novelist in Hollywood. So Howard was then, at a very early age, also exposed to Hollywood through his uncle. So uh, unfortunately for Howard, his mother and his father died uh, when he was a teenager. First his mother when he was 16, and his father when he was 18. And at that point, Howard, the young Howard, made the, the sort of fateful decision that he wanted to run, he wanted to take over and run his father's company himself. He was only 18 years old. There were a lot of skeptics. And he actually had to get a judge to agree to allow him to do this. But he convinced the judge in Houston that he ought to take over the company. And then he proceeded to buy out all of his family's uh, uh, part, you know, part ownership of the company, and he owned it 100% outright. Put it in perspective for us. It's one thing to um, be born into wealth which Howard Hughes apparently was, but he also at one point was, if I remember correctly, the richest man in the world. Uh, I think there's probably a lot of distance between the wealth that he inherited and the wealth he created. Do, do we have a sense of what that was? Well, I, I think it's it's true that uh, he diversified, you know, his, his businesses uh, himself, and he got involved in making movies. He was involved in aviation. He owned, you know, as a majority shareholder of uh, Trans World Airlines. He uh, started Hughes Aircraft Company, which had massive contracts with government contracts. Uh, you know, he then when he came to Las Vegas. He owned casinos and land and different. He owned a television station. We'll maybe get to that later. And he uh, he definitely diversified to the point where he was rivaling. You know, the rich. He was the richest man in the world. And it wasn't just from the, the drill bit anymore. It was from all the different things that he had developed over time. And um, so you know, the numbers that we hear about today when we talk about billionaires, whether, you know, it's Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or somebody like that, those numbers are, are astronomical compared yeah. to what Howard Hughes had. But, but in his day, you know, he was a billionaire, which was, he was probably one of only a handful in the world. Yeah, and you start talking about the Jeff Bezos fortune of yeah. I don't know, one hundred fifty billion dollars, whatever that is. Um, you know, th those are numbers that no one could have ever imagined. Um, but was was Hughes was Howard Hughes an educated man? 
You know, he, he was, but he was not an educated man in the traditional sense. I mean, he, he did well in school, uh, but he, he didn't really ever finish. You know, he, he took some classes at the Thatcher School, which is a very, uh, you know, prestigious East Coast school. And then, uh, he was at the California Institute of Technology, uh, but he dropped out because he wanted to take over his, his father's company. And, uh, and so anything he learned when it came to aviation was self-taught. He surrounded himself with engineers, aircraft engineers, and, uh, and, you know, he learned from them and, and they learned from him because he, he was so intuitive that he came up with things that they couldn't even imagine or think of. And, and, uh, you know, so for that, he gets a lot of credit, but he didn't have a lot of like initials after his name or anything like that. He was very, very much self-taught. You know, when you look at the timing of all of that, I mean, the industries that you mentioned and listed in his list of industries that he was involved with, they were all burgeoning at that point. They're all really in their infancy. Aviation in the early part of the 20th century, um, the, the the film industry, uh, you know, obviously silent films predated the 20th century, but really came into their own in the uh, 1920s. And, and then obviously sound uh, changed all of that into the 1930s. So he was kind of the right in the right place at the right time for a lot of this to happen. Oh, you, you've, you've hit it on the head. You know, uh, uh, he uh, made silent films. That's how he started. He made uh, about three or four silent films before he moved into sound pictures in the early 1930s. And so he was on the cutting edge of all of that uh, in that industry. And he made, made money with these pictures. Um, and then uh, in aviation, I mean, he was right there, at the cutting edge of the the switch from you know sort of the the the, the sort of the Wright brothers and this experimental kind of planes that nobody trusted into the transition to you know traveling across the country at record speeds traveling around the world in three and a half days uh, you know that kind of thing he he was on the cutting edge of all of that kind of technology that we take for granted today. What came first uh, as he started to diversify? Was it his interest in filmmaking, or was it the was it aviation? Did it all happen simultaneously? Well, uh, one kind of merged into the other. So it started with film, and uh, I think this was uh, the fact that uh, he he was fascinated by filmmaking, and it had a lot to do with his uncle. His uncle Rupert uh, was a screenwriter and a novelist, and he was a uh, a household name back in the nineteen tens and twenties. He really was, and nobody's. Unless you've read all the books about Howard Hughes, you've never heard of the guy. But at the time, he was a big figure in Hollywood. So Howard was naturally attracted to this uh, to this uh, industry, and not not only to the industry, but to the you know the starlets who were uh, <laughs> the focus <laughs> of the industry. And he spent a lot of time with them. But he uh, took an interest in filmmaking and, and became quite successful at it. Now, the most famous movie he ever made was Hell's Angels. And Hell's Angels is a World War One picture. It's all about, you know, uh, flying. It's all about uh, fighting in the in the air. And uh, one of the interesting things about that movie is that it, he became so uh, obsessed with these fight scenes in the air being authentic that these guns, the, the, these planes, really were, you know, zipping in and out for, uh, amongst each other, and they were shooting real bullets. And, wow. you know, it was a very dangerous thing. But when you go back and watch the movie now, the one part of that movie that holds up are the flying scenes. And it was during that time that he was, you know, really learned how to fly and learned how, and became uh, passionate for uh, aviation. And so he transitioned from movies. He really dumped movies after 1933 and went full time into aviation. You know, I'm a classic film fan. I watch a lot of Turner classic movies, and often they'll put together these montages, you know, 100 Years of Hollywood or whatever it happens to be. And those flying scenes are always included, you know, right up there with Citizen Kane as being the best movie uh, made of all time. And so I know those scenes. I've never seen the film, though. Does the film itself hold up? I would have to say no. <laughs> you know, the uh, the dialogue is not great. Uh, the uh, the plot is not great, but uh, what you watch Hell's Angels for is the uh, is the, are the fight scenes. I mean, they're, they're, they are amazing. They really are. Let's stay on um, Hughes's work in Hollywood. Uh, he was making films into the 30s, um, and I, he had, um, I think, a part of what, RKO Pictures? Wasn't that part of his company? 
that came later. Uh, he had his own his own uh, company in the early '30s, and you know, although I mentioned that Hell's Angels is the most famous movie he made, probably the best movie he ever made was Scarface, uh, right. which was the which came out in 1932 and was uh, you know about really a story, the first story of Al Capone, right, and and what he was doing in in Chicago, and was the inspiration for the Scarface that came later with Al Pacino. And that movie was very successful, but it faced all kinds of criticism from censors. There were cities that around the country that wouldn't show it because of the violence. Uh, and he had to change the ending, uh, you know, to satisfy the censors. So it was quite a controversy at the time. Now, later in the light, in the 40s, he purchased RKO Pictures. And, and that was a time when he was, uh, I would not say it was the, it was the greatest uh, 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 he didn't have a lot of great movies that came out of that experience. Uh, but he, he, there's a lot of pictures that you see, uh, that you'll see when you watch Turner Classic pictures that are, are RKO movies from Hughes' time. And, you know, uh, an example of that is a movie called The Racket. And, uh, what's interesting about that movie is that's a remake of his first version of The Racket, <laughs> which was a silent picture in 1928. And he remade that in 1951. Uh, uh, when he owned RKO. He was well known uh, for having, as you mentioned, an interest in the starlets of the day. He, um, oh, yeah. he got to know quite a few of them, didn't he? He did. You know, he, uh, one of the things that he mentioned, you know, the classic movie channel, my wife loves that channel. And, and one of the things that annoys her is she, I'll, I'll pop in when she's watching one of these movies and I'll, I'll say, okay, who who are the women in this movie? Who's starring in this movie? <laughs> and eight times out of ten, you know, uh, what he, Howard Hughes dated that actress. I mean, I, I this example of some names, you know, he dated uh, Betty Davis, Ava Gardner, Olivia de Havilland, Catherine Hepburn, Hedy Lamarr, Ginger Rogers. He almost married her. Janet Lee, Rita Hayworth. I mean, Jean Tierney, Joan Fontaine. All of these actresses from that era at one time or another, you know, dated Howard Hughes. There actually are two exceptions to that rule, and they're the people who often are most closely associated with him. One is Gene Harlow, who appeared in Hell's Angels, and Hughes is largely credited with, with discovering Gene Harlow. But he never dated her. Uh, they didn't really get along. <laughs> and supposedly Hughes didn't really like her personality. <laughs> The other was Jane Russell, who was very closely associated with Hughes. Yeah. And they made the movie The Outlaw in the 1940s together. But they never uh, were romantically involved. And, and uh, Hughes respected her because she really rebuffed his advances. And uh, he ended up, you know, giving her a paycheck, for a, mon- a monthly paycheck for, for decades, uh, you know, later in his life because he just wanted to take care of her. Now, the Jane Russell story is an interesting one as well, because that film, is uh, The Outlaw, is all about Jane Russell. Oh, yes, And not necessarily yes. her acting. No, it, it, not so much. He, uh, you know, he was, was really taken with, with her look, and he wanted this movie to be a very, you know, very sexy movie, and for Jane Russell to be, uh, to look her best, as it were, in the movie. And, uh, and she does, you know, frankly. Again, not a great movie. It, he was, did direct the movie himself, which was, not always the best thing, uh, because, you know, he was, again, he was, you know, self-taught. He didn't really, you know, study directing the way so many others would. But, uh, but so it's not a great movie, but Jane Russell is great in it. One of the other, uh, I guess, places that I've kind of crossed with the Howard Hughes story in an unexpected way was um, when I read the autobiography that Catherine Hepburn wrote. I think it's called All About Me, if I remember correctly. And she dedicates uh, quite a bit of that autobiography to her relationship with Howard Hughes. I wasn't aware that they were that close, but they were very close for a long time. You know, they really were, and and it was an unusual connection uh, between him and Catherine Hepburn. And, And I think that had to do with the fact that he respected her so much. You know, she was a lot like him, really. They were independent. They were entrepreneurial. They were headstrong, and um, and 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 so they were. You know, you think they're almost like too much alike to get along, but in fact, a large people who knew Howard Hughes generally claimed that he had you know, really three loves in his life. You know, three true loves. One was Billy Dove, the silent film actress, um, whom he left his first wife for, and then there was 
you know, Catherine Hepburn, and then there was his his wife later, Jean Peters. But with Catherine Hepburn, uh, they even lived together, you know, in a house in Los Angeles for a period of time, but they hardly ever saw each other because she was so busy with her career, he was so busy with his career, that it didn't really work out. Uh, but, you know, I think she really, really liked or loved him, and, and he certainly felt very strongly with her. But it just, it was, their lives were so active at that point. They were rising so quickly in the public eye that they didn't have time for each other. Tell me if I remember this correctly from the autobiography or if some pop culture influence is making me remember this. But uh, I, I seem to remember a story that Catherine Hepburn told where she was playing golf and Hughes flew his plane and landed yeah. it on the golf course to see her. No, that is absolutely true story. And it, it is depicted in The Aviator as well, the movie, the Martin Scorsese movie. Um, you know, that's true. You know, Hughes was a very unorthodox individual, and, and uh, he was trying to get her attention. And uh, he did. <laughs> uh, by landing it, he, you know, he was fearless in an airplane, and we may get to this later as well. But he crashed a number of times because, he, you know, he just took chances with, and many times with airplanes that weren't really ready uh, they, you know, sort of like they just hadn't been fully tested yet. And he was up there testing them, and, you know, things went wrong, and he would crash. Well, that made him a little bit fearless. And so landing on a, a golf course was not unusual for him. Um, he had a lot of romantic interest. You mentioned the fact that he was married, I think, what, twice? Twice total, uh-huh. Were those marriages... Well, unless, six... you, unless you believe Terry Moore, who said that they were secretly married as well. But uh. there, was two, there were two real marriages. Yeah. Were they, were they uh, marriages of love, convenience, or is it kind of hard to tell? Well, I think the first one, uh, you know, when he was very young, uh, was a marriage that uh, was never meant to be. Uh, you know, he married when he was young, largely to sort of show his maturity. Remember I was mentioning about how he needed yeah. to mm-hmm. just show that he was an adult so he could take over this company. And he married uh, uh, this woman named Ella Rice, and she, you know, Rice University, that's the family uh, that she was associated with, and and so for for Hughes, this was a sign of you know social status and so forth. But they they never really hit it off, and and ultimately when they moved to Hollywood, you know Hughes started uh, you know having affairs pretty quickly, and they ended up getting a divorce. And then uh, later with Gene Peters, I think uh, this was when he was become moving into his eccentric phase, and he was very concerned about you know, someone in his company declaring him mentally incompetent or something like that. And you would, you would, if you're married, you would need your wife to agree to that, you know. So Gene Peters was someone I think he really did love. And I've been told by people who know Hughes, knew Hughes, that they really did love each other. Uh, but they lived together very little of the time that they were married, maybe a year and a half of, a total of the about 13 years that they were married. And did he he have any children? No, he did not. Um, although I will tell you that uh, uh, when I've been I've done public talks about Howard Hughes, or I've uh, I've uh, done something like this related to Hughes, I've been contacted by people who tell me they're the long lost mm-hmm. love child of Howard Hughes and <laughs> Catherine Hepburn, or something right. like that. Uh, but no, no children that we uh, that we know of for sure. We're talking tonight with Jeff Schumacher. Uh, His website is his name, jeffschumacher.com. His book is called Howard Hughes, Power, Paranoia, and Palace Intrigue. Now, this is an updated uh, edition of the book, right, Jeff? That's right. So the first uh, edition of the book came out in 2008, and this this new edition is much uh, longer and better. And again, you know, not everybody has a chance to kind of redo their book, <laughs> uh, but I did have that opportunity, and I learned so much in the time since the first edition came out that the second edition is, I think, the final. You know, it gives it covers everything I really want to cover. Jeff, when we opened up the discussion tonight, I told you the story of how I became fascinated with the life of Howard Hughes. Something happened along the way for you too to be able to um, d- dedicate this much time and energy into an all-encompassing book about the man. Uh, is there a story that goes along with that? Well, I, a small story. Uh, you know, uh, my first book is a is a history of Las Vegas. I, I worked as a journalist in Las Vegas for many years and. I witnessed the growth of the city in the latter part of the 20th century and thought, you know what, uh, I've sat with a front row seat for everything that's been happening. Why don't I be the 
the person to document that in a book. So my first book is about really the growth of Las Vegas from World War II to, let's say, to the year 2000. And you can't write that story without doing at least a, a healthy chapter on Howard Hughes. So I started researching Howard Hughes, and I was extraordinarily fortunate in doing that chapter that I was able to talk with Bob Mayhew, who was uh, Hughes's right hand man, uh, you know, during uh, his Las Vegas years and a little bit before that. And I talked to a couple other people as well who had known Hughes. So. When that book came out, and uh, I, I realized, okay, I'm, how am I going to follow up this book? I thought, naturally, there's more than enough material uh, on Howard Hughes to, in his role in Las Vegas for me to focus on that for my next book. So that's what I did. Did Hughes have the Midas touch? Well, he kind of did. I mean, when it, certainly when it came to um, aviation, he did. Uh he, you know, he really built Transworld Airlines into one of the biggest airlines in the world. Uh, you know, he, um, but I would say that it's a mixed record only because let's uh, when we're talking about Las Vegas, for example, when he came to Las Vegas uh, in 1966, he had no intention of buying in, in any casinos. That was not on his agenda when he came here. Uh, he hadn't, wasn't thinking of becoming a casino mogul. He sort of happened into that, you know, because they wanted to kick him out of the Desert Inn Hotel when he was living there, and he didn't want to go. He said, well, I'll just buy the place, and then uh, then they can't kick me out. So I I think that sometimes it was luck, and sometimes he was, had the Midas touch, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, his pure drive carried the day. You know, setting the land, you know, the air speed record in 1936, and you know, uh, and setting the record for traveling around the world in 1938, and uh, these are things that required him to, you know, do amazing feats, you know, uh, physical as well as in engineering feats. So it was, a, it was a kind of a combination, I'd say. Let's talk about his uh, role in aviation history because he is considered to be one of the most influential aviators of uh, all time. Um, I think I don't know. There's a list somewhere, and uh, he's he's prominently featured on the list. What was his? Uh, what were his contributions to aviation? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I've uh, I've talked about some of those items that uh, he's often credited with, and and. Unfortunately, each time I do that, somebody will tell me, oh, someone else did that before him. <laughs> but uh, what he did was he put whatever it was that he did, he was the one who made it well-known, and he's the one who made it work in a big way. So, for example, uh, you know, retractable landing gear, right? He, his planes, he developed his planes in the 30s with retractable landing gear, and the reason he did that was that he wanted to go faster, less speed, you know, less air resistance. Right. And and that became the standard for airplanes around the world after that. Now, he did not invent retractable landing gear, uh, but it, it, it was important for him to adopt it and embrace it and to perfect it. And so that's where he deserves the credit in that, uh, in that regard. Um, you know, having uh, – this seems like a small thing, but it's really important when you're trying to go fast through the air uh, – flush rivets. So – you know, instead of having the you know these screws sticking out of the side of the airplane, uh -huh. all, everything was riveted, so it was flush along the edge. So, you know, you would have less wind wind resistance once again. Um, so these are important things uh, that he that he was involved in. Also, uh, he also influenced the design with his planes that he put together in the mid '30s. He influenced the design of fighting fighting jets and planes that were or planes that were used during World War II. Um, so that's important, you know. I mean, he, he really the Japanese Zero is a, is a copy of his H one racer. Oh wow! Uh, you know, uh, is, the Japanese has picked up basically picked it up and, and ran with it. Um, so those are some of the things he did there. Now, when it comes to like Trans World Airlines, it's important for him. Uh, his contribution there was to make flying as comfortable as possible. We take that for granted. Well, remember, you know, in our when we were younger, planes, getting on a plane, there was plenty of leg room. That's right. <laughs> uh, you recline, your, recline your seat. There was plenty of room. There fully cooked meals if yeah. you were on a long flight. <laughs> That's right. A lot of that has gone away, sadly. But it was Hughes who really pushed for that kind of service on, on an airline. 
And, uh, you know, because he was flying people, you know, it was Trans World Airlines, so it was an international, uh, these were such very long flights, and so he wanted people to be comfortable. If you, if you go back into the 19, early 30s, and you were someone who was flying on a commercial plane, it was very uncomfortable. I mean, the plane was all over the place, uh, so, you know, and, and the, the noise was horrible. And you know it was not comfortable at all. Yeah, it was kind of like kind of like riding, kind of like riding. Yeah, kind of like riding in the back of a truck <laughs> on a bumpy yeah. dirt road. <laughs> That's a good way to put it, for sure. Um, but he was also, uh, as you mentioned, fearless, and he was often his own test pilot to try out some yeah. of these ideas. Well, that's absolutely right, and and you know maybe to to a fault, you know, but but he was he wasn't just like ordering other people around, you know, uh, you know I don't think you know if you're Bill Gates or Warren Buffett and you're you're not out there, you know, in the in the line of fire, you know, I'm not knocking those guys, but Howard Hughes was taking these planes up himself, and he was risking his own health and, and his own life, really in some cases, because if there's some kind of malfunction, he has to deal with it. But his mind was, his mindset was that he, the only way he was going to know how these planes performed is if he was in them and he was flying them. And uh, unfortunately, that led to some crashes. And, uh, and uh, they, they really contributed to the, his downfall later in life. Yeah, he, um, he was lucky to survive uh, a couple of those. And uh, he had uh, long-term effects from at least one of them, but probably a culmination of several. Um, how close to death was he in some of those crashes? Well, probably the well, certainly the most serious crash that, that Hughes was involved in occurred in 1946, and he was flying his uh, ex- again an experimental plane. Uh, it was an XF-11. It was going to be a reconnaissance plane for the Air Force, and uh, he was flying it in Southern California. And he crashed it into the Los Angeles Country Club, and uh, you know, just it, it was it was right before the course. He if he had landed on the golf course, he might have been okay, but he landed in the backyard of the house, <laughs> and uh, it was a very very hard crash. Uh, and uh, the plane was on fire, and the fuel tanks exploded, and and Hughes is like trying to scramble out of the plane. He managed to pull himself out of the wreckage. And then he was helped away from the plane by a Marine uh, who happened to be in the neighborhood visiting friends, a guy named William Durkin. And William Durkin pulled Hughes away from the plane and, and really rescued him because he, he could have caught on fire, could have been a victim of one of these explosions, but instead uh, he was pulled away. But the injuries that, that Hughes sustained in that crash were profound. I mean, multiple broken bones. Uh, his chest was was uh, crushed to the extent that his left lung collapsed. Uh, his heart had moved literally from the right, you know, the right side of his chest cavity into the center. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, he had numerous third-degree burns. And so when he went to the hospital, uh, there were doctors telling the press that evening, I don't know if he's going to make it. That's how serious it was. Um, so later, uh, he was, walks out of that hospital six weeks after the accident. And he really probably should not have done that, to be honest, mm. because it was too soon. Yeah, there's a lot of speculation, and we'll get into the the later part of Hughes's life a little bit later in our discussion. But just to tie, kind of tie it together here, there's a lot of speculation that much of his behavior that we call eccentric was related to the uh, consistent pain he was in from that crash. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And uh, you know, he, I think some of this was was things that he'd been dealing with his whole life, like his obsessive compulsive. Uh, uh, disorder, and uh, just kind of a germaphobe, which I think he picked up from his mother, who was like that. But what happened is, later, when he was in so much pain, he was taking pain medication, he, this exacerbated every all of his eccentricities, for sure. What's the, um, the story, or what accomplishment did Hughes have um, in traveling around the world in an aircraft? Was he one of the first to do that? He, he was not one of the first. However, he, he just destroyed the previous record. Um, in in 19, July 1938, um, Hughes flew around the world in 91 hours. So that's three days, 19 hours. Wow. And, and he beat the previous record, which had been set in 1933, uh, by four days. 
So, you know, it's pretty amazing feat to consider that he cut four days off of the world record. Um, so, you know, what was amazing about Hughes was he did that with a small crew uh, and it was a, a plane that he and his crew had put together, a twin-engine uh, plane with a four-man crew. And he had the latest, like, navigational equipment, the best radio equipment. So he had all the best stuff, had a great crew with him. And they managed to, again, travel around the world in record time. He left, he, after that, he was essentially the most famous man in the world for a period of time. You know, every newspaper across the country, not just the United States, but all over the world, had him on the front page for his this achievement. And then there were, there were ticker tape parades in three cities. There was in, in uh, New York and, uh, New York and Houston, and I'm forgetting the third one. <laughs> And uh, and it was amazing because, you know, everybody knew who Howard Hughes was instantly on that day. I keep seeing, uh, th- scrolling through our chat room, people mentioning the Spruce Goose. And, of course, yes. I do I do seem to remember um, in that film that I, I talked about in the beginning of our conversation, um, him flying that gigantic plane, right? That's the one. And tell us the story of the Spruce Goose. Yeah, so th- that is a great story, and it's an- it's the next logical thing to talk about. So during World War II, um, Hughes uh, and Henry Kaiser partnered uh, to put together a what they called a flying boat. And this flying boat, they wanted to transport troops and equipment across the Atlantic Ocean. And the reason was they didn't want to, you know, what was happening is the German U-boats were, were knocking out ships left and right, troop, right. troop ships. And so they wanted, if they fly them over, they could avoid the U-boats. That was the theory. So the government uh, put together a contract, uh, and, and Hughes uh, uh, took the lead on developing this plane, which he called the H-4 Hercules, H-4 Hercules. And, uh, and unfortunately, it took him a long time to develop the plane because it was so big, and also because uh, he was forced to use wood to develop the plane. He developed this thing called Duramold, which was a, uh, a very uh, solid material. But it, because metal needed to be used for other more you know, immediate needs in the war, he was not able to use that in this plane. So it took him much longer to build the plane than, than he had hoped. So the plane was not ready by the end of the war. And then the critics started coming in. Critics started saying, well, uh, this, this is a, you know, a boondoggle. Uh, that, you know, he was just trying to, to get money from the war effort, take advantage of the war to make money. He was then was called to testify at a Senate committee in 1947, and he blew these senators away with the eloquence of his argument for how serious he was about this airplane and how hard he had worked on it. And uh, he vowed there in those Senate hearings that he that, that plane would fly, or if it never flew, if it didn't fly, he would leave the country. That was his that was his promise. Well, uh, soon, not too long after those Senate hearings, Hughes got into the plane. The, what would, the press had called the Spruce Goose because of this. It was made of wood. It wasn't actually made of spruce, but that's another story. Um, and uh, the Spruce Goose, uh, where he took it out into Long Beach Harbor, uh, south of Los Angeles. And he was just puttering around, and people thought he was just testing it on the water. And then he increased the speed, and he increased the speed. And he got to the point where he was able to lift off, and he flew the plane. Uh, uh, in the, and people were all witnessed it. There, was, there were cameras, there were video cameras, uh, uh, film cameras, I guess, in those days. <laughs> and uh, this was all verified that he had flown this plane. Uh, the thing is, that was the only time the uh, Hercules ever flew. Is that plane um, on display somewhere? Indeed it is. Uh, for a long time, it was it was on display at the, in Long Beach, California. But uh, for the past 20 years or so, it's been in uh, Oregon. It's at the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum in, in uh, McMinnville, Oregon, which is outside Portland. I had an opportunity to go up there and, and take a look at it for the book, and uh, it is as big as promised. I, I, you know, obviously never standing next to it. I, I don't know, but can you put it into some kind of size perspective for us? Uh, I would say, I mean, it's <laughs> that's a good thing, a good way to put it. I, I would say it's a, it, it, it would have, the, a Walmart would have trouble holding it. I mean, it, wow. it, 
it is a very, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's, um, it's, the wingspan is 319 feet. And, uh, you know, that just gives you an idea. And it was able to carry, it would have been able to carry hundreds of troops across the ocean. Wow. <laughs> uh, it was a really, really big plane. I mean, three, and, and by the way, he again, once again, Hughes flew the plane himself. Right. You know, it, a lot of technology goes into a, a plane that size, and he had mastered all of it enough to fly it. And in the 300, uh, what'd you say, 319, what, whatever that is, that's that's a football field. Exactly. Exactly right. Wow. Um, so as he, you know, uh, progressed through the decades, um, he um, was involved with TWA. He had some other airline ventures. Um, did he remain in the airline business until his death? He did, uh, through in a little bit different form, though. Uh, later on, after uh, TWA, uh, he was involved. He had Hughes Aircraft Company, and Hughes Aircraft Company was a uh, it was a very important defense contractor. But it was more focused. It wasn't focused on building, you know, airliners or or even by then, uh, it wasn't involved with building airplanes themselves. What they were doing is they were developing uh, uh, missile systems and uh, aircraft computer systems and and uh, different kinds of of uh, systems to like uh, what's the word like to know where you are in the air like a radar system mm-hmm. and uh, and they were it was top secret stuff that they were doing during the Cold War to try to beat the Soviets and uh, and Hughes Aircraft was one of the right in the forefront of all of that technological innovation. Be sure to check us out on YouTube. Subscribe to the channel when you find it. It's JV Johnson's Beyond Paranormal. It's a great way to be involved in our online community. There's about 600 episodes there for you. There's nothing, you know, no fee or anything. Just sub- subscribe. Find us on Facebook as well, and also the podcast version of the show. Very popular. It's a great way to stay in touch with what we've got going on. If you travel, which not many of us are doing right now. But if you're home looking for something to do, it's also a great way to stay in tune with all the topics that we uh, address on this program. Tonight, we're talking with Jeff Schumacher about his book, Howard Hughes, Power, Paranoia, and Palace Intrigue. But I did have a question from the chat room I wanted to pass on related to aviation. It's about the Constellation, a very famous aircraft. Did Hughes design that aircraft? So he often gets credit for for designing the Constellation, but but I I don't think that... uh is true. Uh, I, I will say that I think he played a role. Uh, he loved to tinker and he loved to say, you know, if I'm going to be buying these airplanes, he would tell these uh, Lockheed and other companies, he said, I'm going to be buying these that I, you know, I want to have some say so over what goes into them. So I think there's, I think it's fair to say that Hughes had a role in the development of the Constellation airliner, but I think it's unfair to say that, that he, you know, he designed it. Let's talk about Howard Hughes and his entrance into Las Vegas. We often think of Las Vegas as it stands today, but that's not quite what it was back in the 60s. And it's people like Howard Hughes, maybe even Frank Sinatra and Elvis Presley that kind of built, or at least started the process which built the Vegas we know today. How How did Howard Hughes become interested in Vegas, arrive there, and what did he do there? Sure. Well, you know, the first thing to know about uh, Hughes is that he started visiting Las Vegas pretty early on. Uh, we, my research showed that he uh, definitely visited Las Vegas uh, uh, in 1941, uh-huh. uh, and that he spent a lot of time in Las Vegas all through the 1940s and early 50s. Now he might even have visited Las Vegas earlier than that. Uh, some spotty uh, uh, suggestions that he was there as early as the early 30s, but. He really liked Las Vegas, and he liked it because he was outside the limelight of L.A. You know, in those days, Las Vegas was pretty small, and it, you know, but it was still very nice. It was a great, great getaway for people from L.A. And Hughes could fly here, you know, himself, and he could bring uh, dates with him and uh, have a nice time uh, without being bothered. So he really took a liking to Las Vegas. He actually moved to Las Vegas for a time in the early fifties, nineteen fifty-three and fifty-four. He owned a house. In Las Vegas, although he stayed, uh, as far as we know, he stayed in a suite at the Flamingo Hotel. So, fast forward to 1965. Howard Hughes has just sold his shares in Trans World Airlines (TWA) for 546 million dollars. Wow! 
Now, that's a lot of money today, mm-hmm. but it, think about how much money that was in 1965. People have described it as the largest single check ever cut at, up to that time. And so he was needed uh, to do something with this money, or the IRS was going to take a, a huge whack of it. So he decided what he was going to do is, is move to Las Vegas and plow his money into real estate, which he had always done, and into other things that interested him, not necessarily casinos. So he was moved to Las Vegas very secretly on Thanksgiving uh, Day of 1966. Even Las Vegas, most people in Las Vegas didn't even know he was here for a week before word finally leaked out that he was in town. And uh, what he was doing is he was staying on the ninth floor in the in a suite on the ninth floor of the Desert Inn Hotel. And at that point, he was, didn't exactly know what he was going to do, except that he was going to be a big fish in a little pond. And that was the advantage of Nevada is, you know, he could very easily, with a couple hundred million dollars, become the biggest investor in the entire state. And that's what he did. And he... Um was I'm trying to, I'm trying to place the timeline here because I, you know mm-hmm. we, we haven't even talked about this yet because you you are also uh, involved in the mob museum and the mob was uh, instrumental in Vegas's history as well. Oh, yeah. Where does Hughes fit into the mob picture of Las Vegas? Yes, that's a, that's a great question because it's really the heart of the story in many ways. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say uh, that the mob played a huge role in building the Las Vegas Strip. Las Vegas Strip being where all the biggest resorts are in town. And really starting with uh, Bugsy Siegel uh, with the Flamingo Hotel in 1946 and Mo Dalitz with the Desert Inn in 1950, and then a parade of other mobsters coming from all corners of the country, building hotels in Las Vegas and running them and skimming from them, skimming the proceeds and sending them home in bags. Uh, <laughs> that uh, you know The mob had a lot of influence in Las Vegas and a lot of control. And while some people look back at that era fondly, uh, you know, if you're living in Las Vegas and your schools are drained of money and, <laughs> and your roads haven't been paved because all this money is going out of town, you don't feel that great about it. So how, enter Howard Hughes in 1966, and when he starts buying uh, casinos, he, in each case he ends up buying out some mobsters. And whether it was the Desert Inn Hotel or the Frontier, or the Sands, or the Silver Slipper, or the Castaways, or even the Landmark, there was a mob association with all of those resorts. So when Hughes bought them, with great support from the governor of Nevada at the time, Paul Laxalt, because Laxalt saw this as a great opportunity to nudge, start nudging the mob out of, out of Nevada. You know, here is Hughes, still this greatly respected, you know, uh, uh, entrepreneur, he was, uh, you know, uh, patriotic American, mainstream to the core. Most people didn't know about his eccentricities at that time and, you know, and the, and the problems he was having. So if, he, if Las Vegas is good enough for Howard Hughes, it must be good enough for Hilton or good enough for Ramada and these other companies to come into town, the ultimately the corporatization of Las Vegas, right? And uh, it was Hughes who really opened that door. Was... Uh... Put put it in perspective for us as far as what gambling was to the nation. I mean, we have a very different attitude toward things today. Here we are, what, uh, 40, 50 years on versus what gambling looked like in the 60s. Was it, was it, uh, is that where the Sin City comes in? I, I think so. You know, uh, you know, keep in mind that when, Los, when Nevada legalized gambling in 1931, it was the only state in the union that had legal gambling for many, many years, and, and gambling was frowned upon, right? It was yeah. uh, something you did, and it was illegal, and it was something you did in a back alley somewhere. So if, to come to Las Vegas and gamble, you know, that and legally, that was sinful. But beyond that, we also had a reputation, deserved or not, for prostitution, and we had a reputation for people not acting quite the way they did back home. You know, when they came to town, they had a little bit more fun than they would normally have. So... Yeah, dust the dust the, the phrase Sin City. At this point in his in Hughes's life in the mid fifties, when he starts to make his Las Vegas investments and really make that the focus of his attention, uh, was he still what we would consider on the top of his game, or were things starting to change? 
Well, I think things were definitely starting to change. Um, well, Hughes would come reclusive. Um, you know, when he was in Las Vegas, he was in that suite on the ninth floor of the Desert Inn for four straight years. He did not leave the hotel. Wow. And, um, you know, think about the way we're all sort of, you know, sheltering at home today and we're going nuts. Yeah. He, uh, you know, he did that for four years. And he had done it for even longer than that on the front end and the back end of that time. And, you know, he was always staying in hotels, and he was didn't have... The only people who would see him were a small group of personal aides that were selected uh, to, you know, keep their mouths shut and just do exactly what he wanted them to do, whether it was providing his meals or, you know, tre- you know giving taking memos and delivering them or answering phone calls. And and that was that was his life for four years in Las Vegas, and he had a lot of health problems during that time. He uh, need, he was mostly in bed most of the time. Um, he you know was not taking good care of himself, and uh, doctors were you know were pumping him full of drugs, uh, and he was taking he was you know having blood transfusions. I mean, it was a lot of issues going on that uh, really it became even worse after he left Las Vegas, but. Yes, things were changing, and uh, not for the better. And, of course, to put it in perspective in his life, he was, uh, what, in his 50s at that point? Yeah, he died, he died in 1976 when he was 70 years old. So uh, he was in his late 50s, early 60s. Yep. Yeah. So he's in this uh, in this Las Vegas uh, uh, hotel suite, basically. Actually, I think he occupied a whole floor of of the of the um, the hotel. And he's is he still running his businesses at that point? You know, he he is for the most part. Uh, he is uh, making decisions. He's signing contracts. He's you know negotiating with people over the phone or via memo. Uh, but most of the most of the communications that he was having. Uh, were through his right-hand man at that time, a guy named Bob Mayhew. And Bob, one of the interesting stories is, you know, when you're in Nevada and you want to get a gaming license, a casino license, you are required to appear in person before the state gaming control authority. And Hughes was not going to do that. There was no way he was going to leave that hotel suite and go meet with, you know, in front of a board, stand in front of a board and ask for a license. That was not his thing by that time of his life. So Bob Mayhew convinced the governor of Nevada, Paul Axall, to make an exception to the rule and that Bob Mayhew would represent Hughes in front of that gaming board. And the board granted the license uh, licenses for all his casinos based on Bob Mayhew standing before them. Hughes could have been a fictional creation. He could have been long dead, <laughs> you know, and they had trusted, but they had trusted uh, Bob Mayhew to, uh, to represent him. And so that gives you an idea of how different it was uh, at that point in his life. Now, there's an interesting story about Hughes coming to Las Vegas. I'm not sure at which point this is, but but um, he came in a cover of darkness on a train. Tell that story. Yeah. You know, we've been talking all evening about Hughes, the great aviator, and uh, loved to fly. Right. Uh, well, for whatever reasons in his mind, uh, when he decided to come to Las Vegas, uh, in 1966, he wanted to come by train, and he would be coming to Las Vegas from Boston, Massachusetts. So we're talking about a long train ride. And what's more, he wanted it to be a secret ride. He wanted it to be completely secret. He wanted to have his own train, essentially. And so what Bob Mayhew had to do to pull that off was to get in touch with the, the CEOs of all of the railroads who that would be affected by this and have them adjust their schedules so that they, you know, this Howard Hughes, a secret Howard Hughes train, would not run into one of the other trains as it was coming across the country. And somehow Mayhew pulled this off. (laughs) So the train arrives in Las Vegas in the middle of the night, out in the edge of Las Vegas. They stop the train, and Hughes is taken off the train on a stretcher, put into a van. The van drives into, you know, to the Las Vegas Strip, to the back of the Desert Inn Hotel. They go up the fire escape, and he is now, I think they actually went in the elevator, but it was a dedicated elevator that would go to the ninth floor. And uh, Hughes is now ensconced on the ninth floor of the Desert Inn for four years after that uh, train ride. 
we know Hughes's behavior uh, f- gets even more erratic after that point. But what was happening? Do we have an understanding of how much of this was Hughes uh, knowing that his celebrity would attract attention or how much of it was paranoia? paranoia? What kept him from people and the public at that point in his life? You know, I think I think it was paranoia. I think that was a big part of it. You know, he did he was he was terrified of lawsuits by that point. You know, everybody wanted to sue Howard Hughes. In fact, I think there's a somebody wrote a book called Everybody Suing Howard Hughes <laughs> um, at the time. And uh, and 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 so Hughes was terrified of lawsuits because what a lawsuit might mean or or something more serious uh, would be that he would be required to appear in court. And the last thing he wanted to do at that point in his life was appear in court. So one of the things he did is he he, he uh, secured himself from the public so that he would never be served papers. I mean, it was as simple as that. Um, and, the, and the second part of that was just paranoia about, you know, he was kind of, he was disheveled by then. He was not his former self. You know, he had been, uh, you know, uh, really as a young man, he was a very attractive, very dashing uh, man who dated all these celebrities that, but he never really liked the limelight. And so when he had the opportunity later in life, he kind of said, you know what? I have enough money. I have enough people around me to protect me from all this. I'm not going to do it anymore. He kind of checked out. And so that, I think that's how it started. But then it became a paranoia thing. And then at that later, it was a manipulate. Part of it was manipulation by other people in his organization. I may be jumping around a little bit because I'm not sure where this particular story takes place, but I remember hearing something about Hughes uh, going into a movie theater and staying there for four months and watching movies for four months, mostly naked. Is there any truth to any of that? Well, uh, there is some truth to that, yes. So as this goes, I think we're jumping back in time a little bit. So we're talking about really the late 40s, early 50s, okay. when Hughes was still in L.A., and he was, when he, when he wanted to watch movies, he would go to a dedicated movie theater, you know, a screening room at one of the, one of the studios, and he would, he would basically have free reign for this, uh, of this studio uh, uh, screening room, so nobody else would come in. It would just be him and the, and the person running the films. And Hughes would watch films day and night. I can't say if it was four months. I think that feels long to me, but uh, I, I, I'm sure it was an extended period of time, and he probably was naked, and I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> a lot of the time when he was, was living in Las Vegas at the Desert Inn in the suite on the ninth floor, he was not wearing any clothes. And, um, you know, it's just it, things were really spinning out of control with him, and he just really uh, had uh, uh, didn't care <laughs> anymore. But, you know... I mean, if you think about, you know, again, bringing it to our modern day, you know, he's binge watching, right? I mean, yeah, he's right. watched movie after movie or like we do with a television series today. Did he end up um, in Las Vegas buying a television station to cater to his movie wants? <laughs> Indeed, he did. So, you know, this is a good parallel because in the late 40s, I mentioned he's going to a, a screening room at a studio. Well, he did in Las Vegas, he did not have access to a a studio screening room. What he had is this. Te- what he had was the television in his suite, and he took a liking to the late night movies on KLAS Channel Eight. That's a CBS affiliate in Las Vegas to this day. And what he had a problem, he kept complaining about the movies they were showing, and he would call or he'd have people call the station and say, "Hey, you should play this movie or that movie or stop playing this movie." Well. After a while, he became fr- so frustrated with the the lack of cooperation on the part of Channel 8 with these late-night movies that he decided to buy the station. And he bought the station. Uh, <laughs> and after that, every day, the station would have to send him a list of the available movies that they could show that particular night or the next morning. And Hughes then would, would just select the movies that he wanted to see. The problem with this, from the average public standpoint, was Hughes liked to watch the same movies over and over again <laughs> many times. So you might be have a maybe you're a swing shift worker, right? So you're up after you get home, and so it's two o'clock in the morning, and you just watch on Tuesday night. You watch, you know, Ice Station Zebra, one of Hughes's favorite movies, and so you're like, oh, okay, I'll watch Ice Station Zebra, and then like two days later. 
here you come on Thursday night, and there's Ice Station Zebra again. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> How many times? And you have no idea that Hughes is the person, you know, pulling the levers um, when it came to the movies. And there were also some movies you might have wanted to see, but he would never in a million years want to see them. <laughs> so they never aired uh, on that particular program. As we see Hughes start to exhibit some really strange behavior, certainly uh, beyond what we would consider to be social norms, was he still maintaining relationships with women? Did he have romantic relationships that, relationships at that point in his life? You know, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think there's any evidence to show that he did. You know, he he um, divorced his he and his wife, Jean Peters, were divorced in 1970. And they, even though they got along great, uh, they did not had not seen each other in years. They had spoken on the phone, um, and that's about it. When Hughes had moved to Las Vegas in 1966, he had promised Gene Peters that they would move into a home together in Las Vegas. And he went out and actually bought three different homes in Las Vegas area and took pictures and sent all the materials to Gene, who was living in L.A. at the time, and said, your pick, which one do you want to live in? We'll live in it together. Well, it became pretty clear to Gene Peters that he wanted her to move to Las Vegas to be close to him, but that he had no intention of actually leaving the hotel and moving in with her. So she turned him down and said, no, we're not going to do that. I'm not going to move into a house in Las Vegas. I'm more of a Southern California gal. (laughs) And uh, so they ended up getting divorced, and and she uh, received a very nice settlement. Uh, It could have been much more, and she was happy to get what what she wanted. And, you know, she had that money coming the rest of her life. Uh, but after that, I don't think there's any evidence that there were women coming into the Desert Inn to see Howard Hughes. He was he was kind of beyond that uh, by that point. Um, as in uh, other tragic figures, you know, I, I, I've i always been an Elvis fan, and, and yep. his, the later part of his life is a very sad one as well. And one of the things that people always speculate uh, in hindsight is why didn't anybody close to him intervene and try to help him. Did anybody try to do that with Howard Hughes? You know, I make that parallel myself all the time between uh, the end of Howard Hughes and the end of Elvis Presley, and I often add Michael Jackson as well. Sure. And, you know, uh, that to me is a great uh, tragedy that more people did not try to step in and get Howard Hughes proper medical care. He never went to a, a hospital. In those, in those final years, he could have gotten proper care in a hospital. He could afford the best hospital in America. He could have gone to the Mayo Clinic and, and taken out the whole, uh, whole wing for himself if he wanted to. But he didn't do that. He was very difficult with doctors. And the doctors who were hired generally were kind of milk toast. They were happy to get the salaries that they were getting from his companies, and they didn't want to make a lot of waves. And they also were willing to Unfortunately, they were willing to uh, adjust his medication based on the whims of the of the executives who wanted to control what Hughes was doing. So there was really nobody, with one exception, uh, who was trying to help Howard Hughes in those years. The one person who's the exception was a man named Jack Reel, R E A L. And Jack Reel was someone who knew Hughes from the fifties onward, who was involved in aviation. And he was, uh, he became great friends with Hughes. They would talk about airplanes, you know, for hours and hours and hours. And they tried to work out deals together and so forth. Well, Jack Reel in the early 70s was trying to work with Hughes. They were talking on the phone. And Hughes decided at, at one point, I think 1973, that he wanted Jack Reel to become a much higher level executive within his company uh, and really be like his like second or third in command. Well, this did not sit well with the existing executives, especially a man named Bill Gay, who was kind of running things by then. And Bill Gay, basically, because he controlled the aides that were surrounding Hughes, he stopped the communication between Jack Reel and, and Howard. And they, Jack Reel, as try as he might, could not get in to see Howard Hughes anymore, could not talk to him on the phone, could not get his attention in any way. And this was how it was done to keep him out. Wow. Um, speaking of uh, gay, what was the um, Mormon mafia? Yeah. So this is an important important thing to clarify, because uh, most of the folks are, that worked with Hughes, no, I shouldn't say most, 
some of the folks who worked around Howard Hughes were not Mormons. They were Catholics and Protestants and whatever they wanted to be. But there were a large number of Mormons who worked for Hughes, and most of them were hired by Bill Gay. And Bill Gay was uh, someone who was a Mormon man who had worked his way up through the ranks at Hughes uh, with Hughes, and he wanted to hire people he could trust. And so, understandably, you know, he would hire a lot of Mormon, young Mormon men to work as drivers or as security or one job or another, uh, work in the office there in, uh, in L.A., and many of those became aides to Howard Hughes. Not all of the people around Hughes were, were Mormon, but many of them were, and the ones who were the most loyal to Bill Gay were, were Mormon. So this became known as the Mormon Mafia. It's a little bit of a misnomer, but it's really because of Bill Gay that uh, there were so many working for Hughes. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Hughes's um, dabbling, if you will, in politics. I know he was a bit of an advocate or um, um, an activist, I guess is a better way to put it, uh, when it comes to nuclear testing. What was what was he trying to do there? Yeah, so so we talked a little bit about his germophobia. You know, Hughes was, was really uh, going back to when he was a, a very young boy, was, you know, deathly afraid of germs, which is kind of interesting, you know, as we go through this today. But he, uh, one of the things he was worried about was radiation from nuclear testing. Uh, and, and this is something that became much bigger, you know, after he died, right? We were all worried about sure. you know, late 70s and early 80s about, you know, nuclear power plants and so forth. Well, Hughes had something to do with that because he, in the mid-60s when he moved to Vegas, he was started publicizing uh, the dangers of, of nuclear testing. And he was particularly concerned about the tests that were occurring just not too far from Las Vegas at the Nevada test site. And so Hughes wanted to stop these tests. He thought they were going to hurt Las Vegas tourism, and, and but really he was concerned about, you know, how the, this radiation was going to hurt him. <laughs> yeah, it was very self-centered in that <laughs> sense. But he, he also was concerned about, the you know, the if one of these tests went awry, how it would hurt, you know, hurt Las Vegas, which in theory it could. So he uh, wanted to stop these tests. The only way to do that was to convince President Lyndon Johnson that they needed to stop. And so Hughes, you know, got involved in, in trying to persuade Johnson on this uh, through campaign contributions uh, and I guess what you might call bribes, right? He was <laughs> doing everything he could. He would up the ante to as much as a million dollars to get President Johnson to, to shut down the tests. But uh, Johnson did not uh, go along with that. So, uh, you know, it, it would have been... A, a massive uh, thing for him to decide in the middle of the Cold War that we're going to stop nuclear testing simply because Howard Hughes didn't like it. But that's the way Howard Hughes thought. We, um, you again, mentioned his germophobia. Um, there are reports that he would not touch anything without a tissue in his hand. He would use tissues as uh, an intermediary between his skin and whatever he was touching. Um, and... Uh, the other thing that I find very strange about a germaphobe, or at least in his case, is that he wouldn't bathe and he wouldn't groom. And it, it almost seems yeah. to be the antithesis of somebody who was afraid of germs. What's going on there? You know, you, you hit it on the head. You know, uh, he was a germaphobe. He had all these written rules and, and procedures for his staff. Whenever they, want, they were to give him uh, a piece of paper, they needed to uh, certainly be holding the paper with a, with a Kleenex. Uh, between, you know, thumb and finger or forefinger, something like that. And it was very specific as to what he wanted them to do. He also instructed them, this is the weird part, he instructed them not to dust his uh, his suite and because he didn't want them to kick up, he didn't want them to kick up the dust. It would all be in the air at that point. <laughs> but unfortunately, there's a half an inch of dust on everything in his room. And like you said, he wasn't bathing and he, he wasn't taking good care of himself at the same very time that he was worried about germs. It, it didn't really make sense, and it was, you know, part of this, you know, I'm not sure what you call it, but he was definitely mentally, uh, you know, disturbed at this point, and, and not everything was making sense. What happened in the last years of his life? At what point did he basically stop seeing everyone, and how did the last days play out? So Hughes, after he left Las Vegas, he traveled uh, a fair amount. I mean, he was being moved from one place to the next 
He was in Nicaragua at one point. Uh, he was in the Bahamas. He was in London. He actually rallied in London, and, uh, you know, it looked like things were going well, and then he broke his hip. He fell and broke his hip. Yeah. Um, well, by the, the, toward the end, he uh, found himself in Acapulco, Mexico, and things were, were he was really falling fast by that point. And his age, he just had a handful of aides around him, and he was, you know, comatose much of the time. He was sleeping all the time. He was, you know, injecting himself with codeine and uh, with Valium. Uh, it was, it was really falling apart. And the doctors around him, uh, there weren't many, and they weren't taking good care of him. And uh, so, uh, in the end, he, things were. He was starting to to die, essentially. Uh, his kidney failure was starting to take hold when he was in Acapulco. His AIDS kind of finally came around to the idea that they did not want to see Howard Hughes die in Mexico. <laughs> Let's call somebody and see if we can get him to a hospital in the United States. So uh, a plane was uh, Jack Reel put together a plane uh, to fly him from Acapulco to Houston uh, to the hospital there. But Hughes ended up dying in the plane um, uh, on the way to the hospital. So he he never made it uh, to that hospital, which would have been probably would have saved his life. You know, he could have gotten on all the proper fluids and uh, medicine to uh, to you know bring him back, but it was too late. What a tragedy! And you know, this is a story as I opened up our discussion with that uh, stays in the forefront of a lot of people's minds. Um, it's certainly a, a major part of uh, pop culture and American history right now. What makes this story and this man um, have such a long-lasting effect? You know, I think it's it's sort of that, that uh, he, he was a great entrepreneur, first of all, and people always love entrepreneurs because they're, you know, they're, they're people who are taking chances, right? They're people who are trying to advance humanity in some way. And uh, in this case, you know, through aviation, um, through, you know, different things he was involved in, including the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which, uh, you know, would be a uh, subject for a whole nother conversation. Uh, you know, he, he was somebody who was trying to do something important, trying to put his imprint on America. And he did. And the, and the sad part about that, as we've just discussed, is that it ended so badly for him. And, you know, I don't know if we forgot about him uh, collectively in the 1970s or how we want to look at it. But, you know, mostly, unfortunately, today he's remembered for the strange eccentricities at the end, not so much for the great achievements of his life. And, and I wish it were the opposite. Before we let you go, I want to talk about the Mob Museum. Now, things are, I mean, you, it must be surreal in Las Vegas right now with everything shut down. Um, but tell us about the Mob Museum. You know, I love the Mob Museum. I've worked there for six years now. I can't imagine a better job. Uh, you know, it's, it tells the story of uh, organized crime in America and how law enforcement has responded to organized crime over the last 150 years. And we also deal with contemporary organized crime, you know, international uh, drug trafficking and all the rest. And, you know, it's just this is the, the shadow history of America, right? I mean, the crime is, is a huge part of our history. And, and, you know, it's understandable, but, you know, kids in school don't learn about that part very much. And, and uh, it's important to understand how, how influential organized crime has been on the story of America. And so we love to tell that story in, in our in our exhibit. We don't uh, glorify mobsters. You know, we're not interested in, in making them out to be heroes, not at all. And we also we are interested in in highlighting law enforcement figures who who have made a difference in, in striking back at organized crime. And uh, you know, I just can't imagine a, a more interesting uh, museum. And so I'm really happy to be there. Unfortunately, you know, we're closed right now. And, uh, you know, we're going to be closed for a little while. But on a positive note, we're producing tons of content right now for our website. And, you know, there's you want to catch up on, you know, past programs that we've had. We have video recordings of those. If you want to read about all the different mobsters and what they were doing and the law enforcement figures, we have that material. If you want to learn about prohibition and the, the mob's involvement with bootlegging, you know, we have all that and more on our website. So that's kind of where we're hanging our hat right now. 
Uh, between your work and your research on Howard Hughes and your work and research on the mob, it's <laughs> some fascinating stuff there. Where can people get a hold of your book, Howard Hughes, Power, Paranoia, and Palace Intrigue? Well, thanks for asking. The, the book is available at uh, Amazon, uh, of course, and uh, Barnes & Noble. And uh, I, I unfortunately... <laughs> I picked about the worst time, not I, you know, the publisher picked about the worst time possible to uh, release a book because yeah. uh, a lot of bookstores are closed right now. But you can order them. Uh, you can order the book online uh, pretty easily, and uh, it should come, you know, in, in due time. Uh, and uh, I, so that's, that's where it's available right now. I, you know, when things clear and we're back in business, you know, the book will be available in bookstores uh, around the country. And uh, what's next on your plate? Got anything in in the works? Well, you know, I, I think I'm going to probably do a mob related book next, and uh, you know, the, thus being my my latest uh, interest with the museum, uh, probably look at the uh, the early uh, illegal gambling operators who moved to Las Vegas in the early late 30s, early 40s to uh, really the founding fathers of of this gambling uh, mecca. So that's probably what I'm going to focus on. Sounds like it's going to be fascinating as well. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Unbelievably interesting discussion. Um, I find it fascinating in every respect and appreciate your time. Well, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it a lot. Beyond Reality Paranormal is hosted by J.V. Johnson and produced by Orion Palmer and Slick Eddie Edwards. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please consider supporting the program either through your podcast platform, click on the link in the description, or on Patreon at Joha Productions. If you'd like to be a guest on Beyond Reality Paranormal or you have a recommendation for a guest, contact our producer, Slick Eddie Edwards. Eddie is spelled with a Y at slickeddieedwards at gmail.com.